let's dive into the three to one ratio that gets thrown around for military operations. What it means, where it comes from, and if it can stand up to a little historical scrutiny. This three to one ratio is the desired force concentration for an attacking force to have a greater than 50% chance of winning a battle. That's it. Offensive and defensive planning before the fact. Now, I have seen some people incorrectly attribute it to casualty estimates in a few ways, so let's hit that first. There are ratios that can be used to estimate killed versus wounded for specific conflicts, but this isn't it. So, for example, the U.S. Department of Defense has a series of reports outlining American casualty data, and in that, it shows that in World War II, roughly five service members were wounded for every one killed. In Vietnam, that was more like six to one, and during the global war on terror, closer to 10 to one. Obviously, there's a lot that plays into that. Most importantly, the level and quality of care immediately available to the wounded soldier. Now, worth noting, those killed to wounded ratios from the Department of Defense are overall. They're not broken out into offensive versus defensive operations. Another misuse of the three to one ratio is applying that to expected casualties during an operation. So I've seen it used to suggest that if one defender is killed, you can reasonably expect that came at the cost of three attackers. Now that's at least a little closer to the actual use, but still misses the mark. Good rule of thumb here is don't think about casualties at all when you hear three to one. It's a planning factor for the initial phase of an operation. There's a little debate around when this first came about, but it's relatively recently, as in certainly post-World War II. So while commanders in previous wars wouldn't have had exactly this three to one ratio top of mind for a set operation, they understood the gist of force concentration in the tactical fight, or at least good commanders did. The earliest that I've seen this ratio referenced was by General William Dupuy, the first commander of US Army Training and Doctrine Command in 1976. He mentioned that over a long analysis of Fort Leavenworth, his team was able to determine that a defender can hold with a disadvantage of up to three to one. The idea here is that the defending force often has the ability to construct fortifications that they'll be able to fight behind while the attacking force has to advance towards them. All things being equal, that generally means that the attackers will suffer more casualties than the defender. The Soviets during this time period of the Cold War were implementing ratios of their own just with a little twist. Their doctrine stated that attackers needed a 5 to 1 ratio in personnel, 8 to 1 in artillery, and 3 to 1 in tanks. You can see how this starts to get really complicated when you factor in combat multipliers, so more on that in a second. The U.S. Army today references the 3 to 1 ratio in, among other places, ATP 5-0.2-1, the Staff Reference Guide, Volume 1. In this document, they say that based on historical examples, these ratios should be considered the minimum for planning guidance. The Army gets a little more in-depth here and shows what those ratios mean for both attackers and defenders. So for a deliberate attack, the recommended ratio is 3 to 1, whereas for a deliberate defense, that's 1 to 3. So deliberate defense, think of that as having time to fortify a position, knowing that your task is going to be to defend that area. For a delay in action, a 1 to 6 ratio is considered acceptable, which could just be sporadic harassing fire, essentially just enough to prevent an enemy force from being able to move forward at full speed. But there are a few others that kind of stand out. One to one for a counterattack is due to the fact that a well executed counterattack hits a force before they're able to dig in and develop a robust defensive network. In fact, they may be exhausted from their own attack, haven't yet set up defensive positions, and could be operating with stretched supply lines, in which case a lower ratio might be enough for success. Penetration is far and away the largest ratio, suggesting a minimum force concentration of 18 to 1. The idea here is that the lead element would need to not only defeat the initial line of enemy defenses, but then successfully hold against any counterattacks coming from the front or either flank. In turn, a sizable force is needed to ensure your own friendly elements don't get quickly cut off and surrounded behind enemy lines. This doesn't mean the entire force is attacking at once, more that there is substantial combat power locally available to exploit any breakthrough in the lines. Worth noting that all these ratios are meant to be applied to the tactical fight, not the operational or strategic levels. What that means is that three to one easily applies to a platoon of 30 taking on a squad of 10, but at some point it loses its value as a planning factor. It has to be local, relatively confined to a certain sector on the battlefield. The reason for that is that at some point those numbers aren't playing directly into the fight at hand. An easy example here is D-Day, the invasion of Normandy on June 6, 1944. The Allies needed to overwhelm the German defenses in each specific sector. That's what mattered. While all part of the same operation, the force at Gold Beach didn't really affect the fight at Utah, and vice versa. 
I mean, yes, it impacted the German operational scheme of maneuver as they tried to defend against the beach landings because everything's connected. But the Allied ability to defeat the German defenses and move inland was entirely dependent on their force concentrations within a specific sector on a specific beach. On that note, we've got some historical data on division-sized battles from World War I, World War II, and Desert Storm put together by Christopher Lawrence of the Dupuy Institute. So let's see if that 3 to 1 ratio holds. I know I'm kind of talking out of both sides of my mouth here, saying that 3 to 1 only applies at the tactical level. And here we're going to look at division-sized engagements, roughly 15,000 or more per side. So in a perfect world, we'd have a searchable database of squad to battalion level engagements along with enemy force strength, but that just doesn't exist. I mean, there are random accounts and stories for sure, but the majority of our detailed military history here in the United States is focused on the division level. So, you know, this is what we got. Could be better, could be worse. So in World War I, it's just all over the place. The attacker won 67% of the time when they had a 2 to 2.8 to 1 ratio but only 50% of the time when they had a 4 to 4.38 to 1 ratio. Moving on to World War II, which is a little more clear. Here they were able to look at 576 total cases, and it looks like the tipping point is 1 to 1.49 to 1. That's where the attacker wins 55% of the battles, and the odds generally increase in their favor in line with a more advantageous force concentration. This starts to skew a bit when you break out U.S. battles in the Pacific versus European theater of operations. In Europe, it appears that around a 1.5 to 1 ratio was the tipping point where the U.S. could expect for an attack to be successful. But in the Pacific, it was just all over the place. There, the sweet spot was around 2 to 1, but actually failed more often when they were at 3 to 1 or higher. Before moving on, something that comes to mind there is just a vastly different fight between those two theaters. Yes, Germany had defensive positions that the Allies had to fight through, but it just wasn't the same as what they went through in the Pacific. So many of those islands had extensive bunkers and tunnel networks so well protected the Japanese soldiers had to be rooted out one by one. So it at least passes the common sense test that assaulting an island fortress would take a higher ratio for success than fighting across the open plains of Europe or even an urban environment. Moving on to a more recent conflict, we've got the same type of data from the Gulf War in 1991. Of course, not nearly as much data here as we would from World War I or World War II, but across 15 cases, there is sort of a sweet spot between 1.1 and 2.86 to 1. That's the case where the attacker won 100% of the battles. Then moving up to 3 to 1, it actually drops back down to 50% success rate, so not a great sign for our standardized ratio here. So 3 to 1 didn't really hold up. This leads into all the varying factors that play into the ratio, which actually raises the argument as to whether it's useful at all. We saw how the Soviets were including other planning ratios here, which makes sense, but once you open that Pandora's box, you can't close it. Some of those are easier, like numbers of howitzers or tanks, but it gets pretty complicated quick. How do you incorporate in air support? What if the air is contested? Is there a negative factor for enemy air defenses? Or what about terrain? That plays a major factor in every operation, but how can you assign a number to the difference between attacking across open fields to an urban assault? Or what if there are mines in the open field but no enemy trenches? Still 3 to 1? And this isn't even getting into things like leadership, training, and morale. I mean, a 30-man platoon of recently drafted soldiers probably isn't enough to take out a 10-man squad dug in with machine guns. That's going to get ugly quick. On the other hand, 30 elite operators with air support thermals and drones would make pretty quick work of a squad size element set back from the front not expecting any action. But I'm sure you get the point. There are unlimited factors at play for every possible scenario that could arise on the battlefield. So while 3 to 1 isn't a bad place to start, it's really just a ballpark for initial planning purposes, roughly based on historical data. Think of it like this. If a force hopes to be successful while veering way off of those ratios, they'd better have substantial combat multipliers that outmatch the enemy in that specific sector of the battlefield. So while it's hard to dial in a good set of historical data that lines up directly with this 3 to 1 ratio, you got to start somewhere. This at least gives military leaders an idea of desired force concentrations as they're planning offensive or defensive operations. And for all the variables, that's where the art of war comes into play. It's not all about raw numbers, but the commanders knowing their troops, capabilities, and resources, and how that lines up with the enemy they're set to face. But that's all I got for now. Hopefully this helped in understanding what that 3 to 1 ratio means when it comes to military operations. If interested, be sure to check out the National Security SIT reps I put out on Substack. The link is in the description below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.